Man, really excited to have you with us here today, uh, specifically to dive into how your experience in the outsourced CFO space can help our audience better serve their clients. Uh, So Hurley, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. You bet. So high level, if you could introduce yourself, um, give us a little bit of your journey. I know that your space is extremely necessary, especially for business owner clients, yet somehow overlooked uh, or underutilized. So how did you find your your way into this this company? Yeah, so I'm the owner of Fox and Partners, and we are an outsourced CFO and kind of accounting suite to uh, small and mid-sized businesses. And I worked in construction management for three and a half years while I was going to school actually for teaching and education. And so I was I was going to school, teaching, and then working at the at the construction management firm. So I got to experience the small business world, really enjoyed it, worked hand in hand with the business owner every day, was doing kind of all the business side of things business development, marketing, accounting, et cetera. And every time somebody would leave or somebody had to, you know, kind of shift positions, I would go to my boss and say like, hey, I think I can do that role too. So I learned uh, a lot about kind of how the small business works. And so after three and a half years there, I then went and joined a uh, small accounting practice. And it was when I was at that accounting practice that I got to meet a lot more business owners because construction management firm, we were just working with, you know, governments and and large companies. Whereas at the accounting firm, small businesses and small business owners were coming into our doors looking for bookkeeping, accounting, and tax returns. So while I was there, um, I realized there's just a huge gap between business professionals and business owners. So you have, you know, lawyers, financial advisors, CPAs, accountants, consultants, et cetera, who all were maybe doing their niche or kind of in their lane, but nobody was really helping the business owners holistically. And mm-hmm. so I didn't know anything, you know, still learning, just accounting at the time, but I, I could see this gap. And so I just started talking with the business owners like, hey, you know, what are you, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? What's going on here? What would you like to do next year? And it was uh, kind of crazy to me that these accountants would hand back financials or returns with either a loss on it or a lower performance or whatever. And half the time, the business owners didn't even understand kind of what they were being handed back, right? It's just as, hey, we do this, we punch the numbers, we hand it to the account, they give the thing back, we file it, we keep going, and and on and on and on. So I started meeting with a lot of the business owners uh, at least once a month, just asking questions, figuring out what they what they were doing, and then we would do their financials. After a couple months, it started to grow, which again, showed me that there was something wrong with the system because... I'm this 23-year-old kid who doesn't know anything and I'm getting all this business. And so uh, I built a little program kind of out of that of like, hey, we're going to do your financials and we're going to meet with you. And so um, essentially I took that business model once it got to a place where I knew like, okay, hey, there's a market for it and I'm able to sell it. Started Fox and Partners with that model. Uh, We're going to do a company's financials, meet with the business owners. They understand the financials and kind of how basic accounting works. and, And we'll go from there. And so since that time, you know, I've I've learned a tremendous amount about accounting and and the accounting thing. I have my master's degree in accounting. Have have hired amazing you know thirty year vets in the CFO and controller space. Have done you know as much YouTube and reading about accounting and kind of finance and controllership as as uh, as you can. So learned a ton and and started to grow and get bigger and bigger business clients. Um, for your audience, though, I think where I started to find some overlap was. A lot of people work on the business and you have some people work on the personal stuff, but no one was really like, connecting the two. Mm-hmm. And so for a small business owner, the business owner essentially is the business and the business is the business owner a lot of the time. Yeah. And so while we would do the business financials, budgets, financials, P&L, balance sheet, et cetera, I started then to say to the business owner, do you have a personal budget? How much cash flow do you need the business to pay you a month? Do you know what that stuff is? And so you know, for, for a handful of our clients now, we do uh, actually. We only work with them on a personal basis because their net worth is so high that you know once you reach a certain point, a person kind of is a business uh, themselves. So that's the that's the long story of, of how I got from A to Z. But there it is. Thank you. No, that's great. Uh, I get excited hearing that because I think as an advisor, uh, there was a period of my career where I was intimidated by business owners. Uh, one because I was not as experienced as them, or I didn't personally have as much money as they had. But I still had this feeling like they have a need that's not being met in the current system. 
and in our space, and you know, and this may trigger some of our listeners because you know we don't want it to be true, but it is true. Is most of us are just selling stuff. It's either sell insurance to people, and doesn't make the insurance wrong. It's probably solving a problem, but it's very siloed. Or I manage investments, and maybe you sprinkle some financial planning on top, but there's not this kind of holistic deep dive. And I found it's because the advisors aren't getting paid to do it. And we challenge our listeners to say, well, what if you went in and actually charged a fee to do strategy for them? Yeah, We're not coaching advisors to be outsourced CFOs or get into the accounting world like that's... But what if you were just having good conversations with them that didn't have a product attached to it? And it sounds like you had this feeling and it's only been reinforced over time that like this, you know, no matter how successful the business owner, a lot of them are still lacking in this area. Yeah. And, and so in the silo thing, it isn't just with financial advisors, right? Even though I saw that they were financial advisors typically are siloed, but accountants typically are as well, right? Especially on the tax side, like they're just looking at things from a tax perspective um, and they're meeting with their clients like once a year. And, and so, you know, a few things with that is the first, does the client understand the financials, right? Like that's a super important thing. Do you, are we talking at the same language Is the communication there? Same thing from a financial advisor standpoint. And so coming from the teaching world where it's all about communication and how do you teach somebody something, how do you communicate with them on their level? That was so glaring to me in terms of lacking from the business professionals is, does your client even understand what you're talking about and why it's important? Second thing is, most accountants aren't necessarily, you know, again, you can go in, hand out or hand in a return or financials that have a loss to it. They'll file the return, no questions asked and keep going, yeah. right? So that's crazy. And so business owners are neat because they have this vehicle that really can't generate wealth, right? And I think like, so So with all my clients, I work with um, a financial advisor. If they have one, great. Same thing on the tax return side, right? Like we, we're not CPAs. We don't read the tax code and the tax changes all the time, right? There's people who just do that. And so I think where, you know, where financial advisors could could step in is even if you're not going to do the outsource CFO work or the tax work, whatever, if your client doesn't have it, use your network to connect them to someone who does and it will benefit you, right? The, the rising tide lifts all boats. And so um, with the financial advisors that I work with, the business is the thing that will really generate their their wealth, right? The 7% growth is, is great, but if you're if it's the 7% growth on 10,000, 100,000, a million, I mean, it's not like that exciting. Yep. Um, but if you can, how do we cash flow $50,000 a month mm-hmm. into investments, right? And some of that might be uh, on the private side, but uh, some of it should be on the, on the public side as well, right? And then from there, how do you grow the, their net worth at a much quicker pace because cash flow and income is 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 if you're going to become super wealthy, that's how you do it, yep. right? The the putting the hundred dollars a week in is is great if that's where the level that someone's at. You're not really going to see you know dramatic uh, increases, and so from a financial advisor standpoint, you know, and and where I was separate from a lot of accounts is I, I always take the long term approach for everything. So from a financial advisor standpoint, don't worry so much about like if you're going to get paid that day for your hour of consulting. Think more broadly, if I can connect them with people who can help my client make more money, I will then manage more of that money. That's right. And and so um you just, you know, it's just a it's just a couple of years down the road instead of that day when you're doing that hour of consulting. But um that was that was, you know, glaring to me is most business owners don't understand the financials. They will always say, most of them, I work so hard. We did a lot of revenue where we continue to grow, but I don't see any of the money or like, where's the cash flow to me? Yeah. So what we really focus on is on the cash flow to ownership. Mm-hmm. And and then it's, well, once that cash is in ownership's hand, what do they do with it? Right. And a lot of the times it's, hey, working with your financial advisor to diversify your your portfolio because you're so in on the business side of things that um, take that cash from the business put it into the into uh, other investments and so now even if your business struggles for a year or or you know you can't work on your business or you have to sell the business like now you have this other portfolio that's accessible to you yeah i found as i've met with business owners that and i'll use this illustration on a whiteboard at times that you know there's there's the personal and there's the business and there's a line in between and to your point earlier like that line is usually pretty blurred but 
Right. If you treat your business like an ATM, you know, at the end of the day, the business exists to build your personal balance sheet. And is there a clear plan to consistently do that? Because I've met business owners like if, if cash flow is enough for me to live a nice lifestyle, and it might be worth something, but it's not actually growing my balance sheet. Right. Yeah. And, and essentially at that point, it's just a job, right? And so it's a job with a lot of, with, with uh, probably not the greatest benefits, <laughs> way more stress and risk than a, a job would be. And oftentimes you're getting paid less than you, than a company would pay you. Right. And so if that's the case and you, and, you know, put a plan together to try to change that. But if you can't within a certain amount of time, like go work that job where you have actual time off, you have kind of more concrete lines between the business personal and you're getting paid more. But, um, you know, if you do the business, small business thing right, nothing will generate you more wealth than ownership in, in a business that's cash flowing. But it has to cash flow to you, right? To your point, that's the point of the business. Uh, I think a, a lot of times that's overlooked or or once you kind of get in the day-to-day, people lose that uh, that goal, right? Of, oh, yeah, this is supposed to be making me a good amount of money. Yeah, I've, I've found, and I've said this to clients before, that uh, business owners, a lot of times, their knee-jerk reaction is like, oh, my CPA does that. And I don't throw anybody on the bus, but I'll, I'll usually say something like, do you think come tax season, your CPA clears their desk, puts your file in the middle of it, and they sit there and dream about strategies for you? Yeah. And most of the time they laugh because they know they don't because it's just, I got to get this thing done in time. And I think a lot of business owners, especially, have assumed their CPAs are doing stuff the CPA never promised to do. Yeah. And so I think it's trying yeah. to, who on the team is supposed to do what? And is there somebody that's wearing way too many hats? And a lot of times that's the yeah. same. Yeah. I mean, I can't believe how uh, most of the time when we start working with the company's financials, something in the financials is incorrect. Mm. Right. And it's not like we're talking something was categorized as an office expense and it was office supplies. Right. We're talking there's a bank account on there that, that, doesn't exist or credit cards on there that are now old or they forgot you know this asset they bought or something was booked on the profit and loss that should have been on the balance sheet like significant um things that are incorrect but then they're paying five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars for their tax return right but okay so let's say it's a thousand dollars your cpa is probably charging three hundred dollars an hour so for the entire year of your company somebody is spending three hours looking at that stuff they're not going through it detailed. And in fact, as a business owner, you are signing uh, a form that's saying to the CPA, hey, look, you're verifying all this data. The CPA isn't going through typically and making sure every line item is correct throughout the year. That's really the business owners or the accountant side of the business's job to then hand off to the CPA who then takes a look at it from a tax perspective. Um, and, and again, I use the analogy of doctors all the time, right? So like, no one would go to a heart doctor if their foot hurt, but people go to CPA to help manage their funds. It's the, that's the equivalent of doing the same thing. It's a very different skill set. CPAs are typically looking into the past, financial advisors, wealth coaches, et cetera, are looking into the future, right? Well, where do you want to go? What are your goals? How do we get to this point? The CPA is looking, hey, last year was something allocated correctly. Do we have the right depreciation? You know, uh, are we getting, you know, how do we protect ourselves in case you're getting audited, et cetera? Totally different skill sets. So, again, that's that's the CPA world doing a really good job of of trying to take as much business as possible and, and convincing as many people that CPAs can do everything if there's a dollar sign in front of it. But then it's also a, a poor job on the education front of saying, "Hey, look, there are different financial roles. A controller is different than a CFO, different than a CPA, different than a financial advisor, or different than a coach." Nice. No, I love that distinction. That's good. So, as uh, for our advisors listening. I do get a lot of, when we have our live events, a lot of advisors are very comfortable working with uh, you know, W-2 employees where it's pretty straightforward financial planning. They'll charge a certain amount for that plan, but they get nervous to charge a higher level fees to higher net worth people with more complexity because they don't feel like they know everything. What would you say to them when it comes to you know, kind of staying in your lane, but also what we call idea partners is leaning into people that specialize? Uh, for an advisor that hasn't broken into the business owner space because they don't feel confident enough, how did you make that shift? So I I, st- I was always in, on, on the business side because I was in the small business world and then small business owners were kind of coming to me from the tax and, and, and bookkeeping side. So I've always known business owners that, that like that's my uh, that's my group. Whereas, uh, you know, I, I mean, 
I, I interact with very few people who are W2. So I have a very different reality. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but to use a, a, another example, like, again, I don't do tax 24 seven, right? And in fact, actually, most CPAs who are filing your returns are not reading the tax code all the time either, right? Because there's a difference between like filing tax returns and then tax planning, right? So even that's a distinction. And so um, I just really valued networking, both from a client standpoint, but then also from like a team and roster standpoint of everything that I can do for my clients is a value add. And, and, and I just charge a fixed fee every month. And in that fee, I'm doing as much as I can to help that business owner succeed. And so like in some cases, you know, I've, I've connected people with, with, uh, with staff when they end up hiring or with coaches or with the, the tax preparer or with a wealth manager or, and, you know, showing them the private equity side of the, you know, the things and connecting them with investments there. Like whatever I can do to help the business owner, business and client succeed is, is, is in my interest. And so I built a really good team of, okay, do I have good financial advisors? Do I have good foreign you know, uh, tax experts. Do I have a good tax planner? Do I have a good someone who could file the taxes cleanly? It's like, I just went down that list. Yep. And I'm always, you know, networking and talking to people to see, like, can I improve on that, or can I? Is there something that I forgot about that I can then offer to my clients? Um, and so that's that. That would be my advice. There is, if you're trying to break into a space, see who else is in that space already. Have the lunch or coffee with them a few times mm-hmm. and then go in th- kind of through them and through their world and then and then kind of go from there. So um yeah, I think most financial advisors are business owners. And and you know, yeah, just talk business owner talk, talk about, you know, we all struggle with the same stuff, whether it's you know, staffing issues is hard or how do, how do you incentivize people in the right way? Like when I sit in a room and just talk about the shared obstacles to business, that creates a connection as an advisor. At the end of the day, though, what I've heard you talk, like, you do need to know your stuff. So I think in the financial advisor world, if you're relying too much on, like, I'm likable and people want to hang out with me, you know, that might be the rainmaker person. But there's not this technical piece or, like, you're able to deliver it really well. In my opinion, to be a true financial advisor, business owner, you need to learn how to attract the ideal clients, Mm -hmm. communicate your value really clearly, but also deliver it really well. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and don't be afraid to say, Hey, I don't know how to do this or I'm not going to, so I'm going to bring in so-and-so, right? Like everybody knows that nobody knows everything. Yeah. And so when, you know, I think where people get tripped up is when they are shy away from that. Right. And they're, and they don't want to show that they, they don't know something. And then that's how you get tripped up. Right. Is, um, so if you're, if you're operating kind of outside of your comfort zone, Bring in somebody else who's very comfortable in that space. Work with them, learn from them, and just tell your clients, "Hey, look, I don't know this. This person does." And you know, now again, you've shown the honesty, and you've shown the, "Hey, I'm going to actually connect you with somebody else." So you're still providing that value. So don't be afraid to say, "Look, I don't know this stuff." Um, this is a, a again in the medical space that would never happen. Your heart doctor would never say, "Hey, look, here's what's going on with your stomach or foot." They would always say, "Hey, look, here's a specialist that does that." The finance space, those lines are a little more blurred. Um, and we would benefit if we said, hey, look, this is what this person can do and they're operating in their space. Some people are, you know, can operate in, in a couple of different silos. That's cool. Yeah. But nobody can do it all. Yeah. And, and, and practically speaking, you know, we try to talk about things that advisors can do like different tomorrow. I wrote down a couple of things for business owner prospects or clients is to always ask them, you know, do you review your financials monthly and do you understand them? Uh, I, th- I think I, I have some business owners. We'll try to get them a bookkeeper of some kind, um, just so they have consistent data. I feel yeah. like monthly is important for us as advisors yeah. or all business owners. But probably what I don't lean into enough is trying to like, do you understand what you're looking at? Yeah, and and, and you know the the bookkeepers are are a great piece of it, but most bookkeepers don't have an accounting background, mm-hmm. right? And so. Um, that's the action that they're doing it, but they're not really uh, like they're very much in the in the weeds there. And you want somebody who could also look above it. And so a couple of things I would ask is, do you understand basic? Do you have somebody who's helping on the financial side? Mm-hmm. Is somebody else reviewing it fairly consistently? Do you understand kind of how financial statements work? Can you tie out every item on your balance sheet to another piece of paper? For example, you go down to your bank accounts. There's $100,000 in your bank account. Where's the statement that can show that? 
you have a $200,000 asset or the asset purchase document. You have depreciation, where's the last tax return? You have a liability, where's the loan document? You have a credit card, where's the credit card statement? You have equity, where are you withdrawing that money? Every item on the balance sheet should have a piece of paper that ties, says that number's correct. If you do, your financials are going to be pretty good. If you don't, that shows that something in there is not working correctly. And if your bookkeeper or accountant didn't catch that, that shows that, that you probably want to bring in somebody at a, at a little higher level. Then once you know that the data is fairly accurate, you want to track two numbers, free cash flow to ownership on a monthly basis. That means after the profit and loss, which gets you net income, net income doesn't equal cash flow, right? It trips a lot of people up. So you have your net income at the bottom of the profit and loss, but then you then from there, you buy an asset or you pay off a loan, that's cash leaving the bank, but your income stays the same, right? So that trips a lot of people up because they have, a, let's say it's $500,000 in net income, you pay $400,000 in debt service on the principal. So you have $100,000 of cash, you have $500,000 of income, you're taxed on income at 20%, you're tagged 100,000, you're left with nothing. That's where, that's why most people don't have the cash. Got it. They think they should, right? Yep. And so after we take out asset purchases, you know, uh, loan repayments, a, a few other things, we're left with what's the free cash flow that's left. Then that should be distributed to ownership unless the business has a better uh, a better investment for that money than the business owner can make pulling it outside of the business, right? So if the business says, hey, look, if you buy another truck, you're going to make 50% on that money, hard to compete with a 50% return. Yeah. You'd want to track that. But um, So what's the free cash flow number and how do you increase it? Second thing is, what's the business owner's net worth? And that's where financial advisors really come in as well, because you know only part of a business owner's net worth should be in the business. And so you take a look at the full net worth and you track that on a monthly basis. Is that number going up? Mm-hmm. So verify that the information is correct. Again, you can you know email a, a bunch of people and get a free cup of coffee. Take take a look at my financials, just mm-hmm. like you would do in the, in the medical world. Of hey, I want a second opinion. Yeah. Um, and then cash flow to you on a monthly basis, and what's your net worth? Nice. Good. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. I think at times advisors can get intimidated by, I need to know everything um, or I don't know what to ask. I have found that, you know, if you read a couple books, take some online courses about reading financials that, you know, in a matter of weeks, you could know more than most business owners do about this stuff. That's just us taking our professional life seriously. Um, Right. We're saying, I'm just going to hope it works out and try to be convincing with my words. It's like, are we backing it up? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and then and then also like um, the power of lunch and dinner with other professionals in your space, right? Uh, even if it's the like, don't don't shy away from. Oh, they're also a financial advisor. That's cool. You know, again, there's enough clients to go around. What can you learn from them? Have lunch, have dinner with them. Hey, what are you doing? How did you do this? Have lunch with other professionals, then have lunch with with not you know people that may never become prospects. That's okay. It's you're you're growing your network and you're learning from them. So. Um, yeah, online classes, tons of books. YouTube's amazing, and then people in your network. Yeah, and if 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 you're listening to this and you are struggling getting in front of clients, or you feel like a generalist, you know, most really successful advisors I know are still not working with anybody that knocks on their door. They've said, "My business, my team, my expertise is is more geared to work with a certain type of person." Business owners can be a great target market. And I have found that the tax conversation is is a great in conversation. But if I lead with, hey, can I manage your investments? Do you want to buy insurance? Hey, you should redo your will. Those are a little less exciting to them. But if you spend enough time, if you said, hey, for the next four weeks, I'm going to focus on learning what questions to ask. Again, you may not even have the expertise yet like Hurley does, but you would say, do I know the questions to ask? Do you understand your financials? Are you looking at it? I have found if you ask three to five of the right questions in a row, you reveal something to that business owner, a gap, and that there's some level of, of value you can add pretty quickly, even if you're, again, to your point, you don't have to be the person. Uh, but just that conversation alone, I, I've found will get you in the room with the right type of client. Yeah. And then connecting them with the people who can help is, a tr- is, is tremendously valuable. And, um, and then you also just want to make sure, like, again, just to use the medical analogy, because we use it a lot. Before giving any advice, you would want to know where are, is the client or the patient today. You would take the blood test and get you what's your weight, what's your height, what, what's your sleep patterns before giving advice because um, 
you know, you don't want to give advice and then get the test results back and say, oh, it's actually the opposite. Yep. And so in the finance world, like what frustrated me early on was I'd be me with all these clients, like accounting is, is, is the hard part about the business, right? Like you got to dig in. It, it, it's a lot of like hard work, the nitty gritty stuff. And so the coaches don't want to be bogged down with that stuff. And so they'll just give kind of generalized advice without ever looking at the financials or verifying it's correct. To me, that's crazy. Yeah. You know, again, you would never give medical advice to somebody without at least understanding where they benchmarked today. And so um, from a financial planning standpoint, you want to know like, hey, are your financials correct? Is your personal budget correct? Has that been audited? Is your net worth in, in the in the right standpoint? And then the other nice part about the business owner feel from like a client standpoint for financial advisors is if you find them early on and you can help them with their business or bring in people who can help them, they, you can get them early, right? Build that trust. They will generate the income down the road and become your, your, your bigger clients in five to 10 years. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and then guess what? Once they're at like a 10 million, 20 million, $30 million asset and a management client, guess who those people hang out with? Other 10, 20, $30 million uh, people. And if you're, if you did a good job from early on, they'll say, Hey, look, they were with me from the beginning. They brought in people to help me. They've been great. You should, you should talk to them. So I think that's how I grow my company is just kind of climbing that ladder, doing good work for good people. They, yep. they refer you to other good people. Yeah, it's definitely not. You, I have found if you take that approach of, of you know, being a curator of great ideas, being generous with your questions and, and strategies, you, you may not get the sale on day one like I was trained to do as an advisor. It's like, go get the assets, go get the insurance. Right. But it also doesn't take 10 years. You know, it, yeah. it, you're slowing the process a little bit, but... Uh, I think to your point, it does create more rapport and connection. And here's another person that's trying to, you know, every time I meet with Hurley, he tries to sell me the same thing. You know, the, the solution is always another insurance policy, or they always want me to take money out of my business to put it in the market, even though my business is kicking out 40% returns. Right. As advisors, we we want to try to avoid that murkiness to where there's any question in the back of our client's mind that like, who are you looking out for? And I don't think our industry has done a good job of that. Um but, but I feel like the advisor of the future could be that. Yeah, especially if like the more holistic advisors um, or the ones that can take that long-term approach um, will see the results uh, quicker than you think, right? Um, but in a really healthy, sustainable way. Yeah. And, and then the client is never thinking like, are they telling me this because of them or for me, right? And so you know, like how I market this instead of the services we offer, it's the problems we solve, right? So here's the five problems we solve. Do you have one of the problems? If you do, great, let's talk. If you don't, then you're good, right? If you have back your financials, you have a good accounting team, you're looking at your cash flow every month, you're not stressed about your financials, cool, I can't really help you. Um, and that's awesome, hats off to you. There are tons of people who have those problems. And so um, it's solution, we're, we're solution-based, right? We're, we're just trying to solve these problems. We solve them through accounting. Yeah. But the, what we do is solve the problems. We don't just do the books or the accounting. Because if you have perfect accounting and you're losing money every year, what's the point, yeah. right? And so, you know, the, the problem that financial, like as a financial advisor, what are the problems you're solving for your clients, right? We're diversifying, you know, their portfolio. We're helping them, you know, uh, become educated in the financial world. We're, you know, allowing them some tax savings. We are, um, you know, giving them opportunities to to diversify instead of just the business. Okay, so here's the problems that that you're solving as a financial advisor for your clients. Great. Find people with those problems. That's great. Cool. Man, I'd, uh, we could talk on this for a while. Uh, as we wrap up, um, so we we coach our advisors on they should have a great idea partner list, which is kind of the bench you talk about. And it could be your superpower behind the scene as these other professionals. Um, right. How does your firm work? Could you know? Could the advisors reach out to you? Could you be on their idea partner list? How can they learn more about your firm? Yeah, so our website, foxandpartners.com, or just search me, Hurley Fox. My LinkedIn profile will come up. There's not a lot of Hurley Foxes out there, so uh, it's one of the benefits. So my LinkedIn will come up. You can message me, email me. Uh, I'm always happy to talk to anybody, uh, you know, one-on-one. My Calendly link is available. Um, I'm happy to, you know, walk you through presentations that I give to business owners or or to, you know, certain uh, like groups. Um, that are just kind of more educational. We have a ton of kind of educational content or or lists uh, on my website. But if you want to talk, yeah, we could do it. We can do a call. 
um, how how the firm works, you know, for business owners is um, I meet with them. If it's a good fit, we then have a retainer with them. The retainer allows us to go through and essentially audit to, to see where they are now. Um, and then to get them to a clean standpoint, right? So that could take a couple of weeks, that could take a couple of months, right? And so during the retainer process and the onboarding process, we're getting them clean financials. We're learning about that and we're, we're getting those baseline figures. And then from there, we have a monthly scope that's value-based, solving problems oriented. There's not a lot of fine print. There's not a lot of people can let me go at any time. We bill after the month uh, for every client. We bill monthly. It's the same fee, no matter what we're doing. It's the same amount every month, unless you know the company's growing or taking on kind of very uh, additional work. Um, so it's the same fixed price every month. People can let us go anytime, and we're just continually solving problems and, and helping them, you know, continue to grow because. If you're again, if you're taking the holistic mindset, each level there's different than things to do, right? So if you're losing money, then the first thing is to stop losing money. Then is to start making money. Then it's to okay, well, how do I really grow the company? How do I use that to then diversify personally? And then you know I'm fairly involved in the private equity world, and so it's then hey, there's great private equity investments out there. There's you know this type of stuff that you can get involved in to to grow that net worth, and so. We're just doing that stuff with everybody on a monthly basis, um, but rooted in everybody's getting financials every month. That's great. Early appreciate you both.